Hi, I'm Matt Needham, and this is my lecture on motor applications and controls. You have to have the proper motor in the air conditioning and refrigeration industry for the right application. You can't just pick any motor. You can't just take, let's say, a half horsepower um, motor that you bought or took out of an old system for an air handler and evaporator and make it for a condenser fan motor that may be in a dirtier location, may be exposed to moisture, increased temperatures, vibration, this kind of thing. So you have to pick the right motor for the right job. And so it does mean things like horsepower, amperage. You have to have the right um, voltage. Is the motor single phase or is it three phase? And going to manufacturers and parts houses, um, getting information there to make sure that you get the right motor, motor replacement um, is critical. And one of the things, um, even in working in service, is the idea that you have to have the right voltage, not just the right rating for the motor, but you have to make sure, you have to ensure that the voltage that's supplied to that motor um, is adequate. And we have to have some kind of parameter for that. And we say voltages um, plus or minus 10% compared to the rating on the motor is acceptable. Now, that's a, in my mind kind of a loose thing. It's not that at 10.1% over it explodes or at 12% lack of voltage it burns up or anything like that, but there is that guideline to go by. So a lot of times they're always trying, you'll see a lot of different things in, uh, like 208, 230 volt motors, and then you'll see 50 or 60 hertz in uh, even dual voltage motors, the reason that you have a lot of different ratings on them is so that they can take one motor, a motor manufacturer, and sell it to the biggest market possible across the world. So in the United States of America, we use 60 hertz, but in a lot of parts of the world, 50 hertz or 50 cycles per second is common. So they want to make one motor that they can sell all over the world. A lot of buildings in the United States may have 208 volts or 230 volts, so that's why they rate it 208, 230, that it can handle either one. So, example, if you have here 208 volts, and you subtract 10% of that 208 or 20.8 volts, you get 187.2 volts on the low side. Conversely, the higher voltage, 230, if you added 23 volts to the 230, you're getting 253 volts. So we'll say that the appropriate range is 187.2 to 253. Now that's the standard. Let me give you some personal tips on that though. Are you more likely to have too high a voltage or too low of a voltage? Um, you're too, more likely to have too low of a voltage by far. Usually whatever the power company supplies is adequate. They're not giving you too much voltage. Um, and then it's a dirty connection, a loose wire, um, uh, a burned contact that's on its way to feed the motor that then drops the voltage too low. So although we have that, if I ever see a voltage, if I'm just thinking I'm in the 208, 230 volt range, if I ever see a voltage below 200, I start thinking, well, why is this? Do we have a, a loose connection or whatever? And we have that principle that if the voltage is too low, then the motor compensates, it's gonna draw the wattage it needs and it pulls more amperage, which means more heat, which means the motor runs hotter. So I start looking for loose wires and contacts and things like that, but the rating uh, standard is plus or minus 10% um, on the voltages, okay? Now the, other, the only exception I'm gonna to say to that is here in modern times, is if you're next door, and I have heard of this, with higher voltage. If your next door neighbor has solar panels and they're feeding power back into the supply in the neighborhood, you could have a problem under some circumstances with too high a voltage. So I have seen that um, occur, so just be aware of that um, because it has happened. Okay, let's take a look here at this bigger diagram which um, is very similar to a, a drawing in Unit 18 of Refrigeration Air Conditioning technology book and let's go through this and the idea is that you can get single phase from three phase you can't get really um three phase from single phase again the exception for that now in 
2020, 2021, are some of these newer ductless mini splits where they can actually take 230 volts single phase and um, with their circuit boards and everything, make a regular three phase motor out of it um, and send three phase. So they convert it from single phase to direct current and then three phase alternating current and feed those motors. But 99% of the time up till now, uh, you can't you you can get always get uh, single phase from three phase and we typically do so here we have a three phase power supply and this is serving three individual single phase motors um, which would be 230 volts single phase 230 volts single phase 230 volts single phase uh, and I've color coded this to make it easy for you to understand in that we have L1 L2 and L3 and if everything is closed and running, right, all the switches, all the motors, everything is closed and running, and this motor is pulling 10 amps, and this is pulling 10 amps, and this is pulling 10 amps, the question is, if you put your clamp-on ammeter here, um, how many amps are you going to read? So take a look at this diagram for a minute. And the correct answer is for each of the lines, you'll be pulling 20 amps. Let's see why. Well, from L1, I have blue feeding here to this motor. And this is pulling 10 amps coming back there. And this is pulling 10 amps. And the 10 plus the 10 would equal 20 right there. The same thing here from L2 is feeding the first motor and the third motor. So you have 10 amps here and 10 amps here joining together for 20. Likewise, your last one, you would also have 20 amps. Um, so you're getting a total here of 10, 10, and 10, but each one of the legs is only pulling uh, a total of 20. Now, let's um, say that this motor, something happens, the fuse burns open right here. Okay. Now the question is, how many amps are you pulling on each leg? Well, you're only pulling 10 here because you're no longer feeding this motor, but you are feeding this motor. So you would only get 10 here. What about this motor? Well, guess what? Even though it's red, this motor's not running. So no, you're not getting that, but you are getting uh, the power to this motor, so you're getting the 10 here. And then the last one is how many amps would you read here? And you're getting the, uh, the green here, and you're getting the green here. Um, so the answer here is 20. So you would pull 10, 10, and 20 amps if this fuse were to burn open. And you may want to replay this part of the video to think about that. Uh, a little bit more. Uh, again, amperage is flow or current. Um, how much flow or current do we have for these three motors? Now we have different bearings. Traditionally, we have two main types of bearings. The um, ball bearing, which you may have had on your skateboard at one point. Uh, it's a louder bearing, it's a stronger bearing, and it takes um, grease. And then you have ball bearings which um, is a lighter bearing and it takes oil to lubricate and it's a little quieter. And we tend to use a lot of ball, I mean, sleeve bearings because it is quieter and you don't want like noise transmitted down a metal duct uh, because certainly um, considerations like noise from air conditioning systems is a big part uh, of comfort for the person and a sales point that they're always advertising, well, this unit is quieter uh, for whatever reason. So um, now a couple notes on bearings on how often to lubricate them. Um, a lot of bearings now are sealed bearings because they kind of make them where, hey, I'm just the manufacturer. Let's just not even make it a maintenance issue so we can get it past warranty. And that's what they do. Older bearings that required oil um, with that they had these little oil ports that you could drip oil into. If you didn't maintain them, they wouldn't last very long. However, if you did, 
they could last a long time. I had a, I have a house that I changed out the unit uh, last summer. And that house I've ha I had for my first house for a long time. And I that fan for the air handler, for the furnace, when I threw the unit away, it was still working. And it had these two little tubes. And I every six months since 1994, I had oiled it when I changed the filter religiously. And it never did go bad. And it lasted 35 years. So a maintained bearing uh, can actually last longer than a sealed bearing. But... How many people are out there like me, like absolutely lubricating it constantly? Um, maybe not. So, and then a ball bearings, they have grease fittings also known as, do you know the word? Zerk fittings and Zerk fittings, you can add grease to. Um, and if there's a relief plug, you have to take that relief plug off so you don't overpressurize it. And... Uh, all things considered, if you're doing a maintenance program, bearings that require oiling need to be done more often than bearings that take grease, ball bearings. Bearings that run more hours need more maintenance or need to be lubricated more often. Bearings that are in warmer locations also need to be lubricated more often. So if you had a ball bearing in an attic for an exhaust fan or something that was running 24 seven and required um, oil, it, you probably would need to be oiling that every two or three months. On the other hand, if you have a grease bearing that runs very seldomly five or six hours a week in a cool location, you might not only need to lubricate that every couple of years in reality. So there's some maintenance tips um, for you. Also, let's talk a little bit about types of mounts, motor mounts. You have sometimes rigid mounts where the metal motor of the metal base is mounted right to the metal of the unit. Um, and in that kind of situation, you don't need to have a green ground wire going back to the metal frame because you have metal touching on metal. But a lot of times we do have rubber grommets, rubber mounts, um, and the motor's sitting on some rubber, therefore you have to have that extra green wire in case the winding comes loose inside the motor and touches the case. It has to have a path back to ground so that we can trip the circuit breaker and kill um, the circuit. So we have cradle mounts. We also have um, belly band type, which is like a giant hose clamp, but like a, a kind of a big thick heavy metal that goes around and clamps around the outside of the uh, motor um, and then you have uh, sometimes end mounts for little types of let's say exhaust fan motors or combustion blowers things of that nature you also have a couple of types of drives you have direct drive where you'll have a shaft like a motor shaft here you'll see that here's a motor shaft um, driving something, typically maybe something like a pump. And then you'll have a coupling, something like this. We'll use this eraser, which is black, and that the RPM of the motor is going to be the same as that of, um, let's say, the pump. And what kind of aligns it and holds it together and deals with some of the vibration um, is uh, um, your coupling here, which I'm using as an eraser and a very famous company that makes these couplings is the Lovejoy cup, uh, company and they have these sort of black um, couplings and one of the ways to find out if you have a lot of vibration and wear and you're going to need to do a repair or replacement soon not tomorrow or necessarily next week is if you look under right directly underneath um, the coupling and you see like a black talcum powder that means this is starting to rub or wear, and it's a sign that you need to be doing something here in the next few weeks or months so that the, you don't have a failure, okay? Also, you have um, belt drives where you have a motor that spins a pulley, which is smaller, and then it's going to sp uh, spin a larger pulley, uh, and it has a fan belt that goes around it. And every time the motor goes around one time, the pulley for the fan doesn't go around quite one time. So um, the fan is always going to be going slower than the motor. And the bigger the pulley on the fan, the slower it goes in relation to the motor. 
The smaller it on the fan, the faster it goes. The bigger the pulley on the motor, the faster the fan is going to go. So we have this um, relationship uh, and we have different types of belts. An A belt is a thinner belt, similar to a 4L belt. And then a B belt is a thicker belt. Um, and sometimes we have two or three of those on a larger system. Okay, let's go over the terms RLA, FLA, uh, and LRA. RLA is run load amps. And for our purposes, it's really the same as FLA, full load amps. That's kind of like the maximum amperage that you want a motor to pull on a regular basis. Now, why do I say a regular basis? Well, a lot of times, like for a compressor, a hot pull down in refrigeration where the box is abnormally too warm, you might have a full load or run load amps of 10. And maybe for the first minute or two, it's pulling 11 amps, but then it comes back down to 11. That would be okay. Um, but you don't want to be on a continuous basis running above the full load or run load amps. Now what is LRA? It's locked rotor amps. It means when the shaft is not moving, we could say stationary or locked, it's how much energy does it take to get that to start going? Because it takes a lot of energy to start a motor, it doesn't take that much to keep it going. It's like riding a bicycle. Um, a lot of times you have to stand up on the pedals to get it going and then you're just going away like Pee Wee Herman, right? So. Um, it's that inrush current, the locked rotor amps, which for an air conditioning or refrigeration compressor is five to seven times. And that if a motor has a full load amps of 10, it might take 60 amps for just that half a second to get it to go. And then it drops back down to the 10 or 11 amps and then down to 10 and as it runs longer, nine and like that, that's fairly typical, okay? Those are four compressors. Now, it doesn't mention this in the textbooks, air conditioning, refrigeration textbooks, any of them that I've seen. But here's a point for you, and it makes sense, that for fans, the locked rotor ramps is typically three to three and a half times more for locked rotor ramps than run load amps or full load amps. So that if you had a big fan motor that was pulling like our 10 amps, one of these, if they're fan motors, might pull 30 or 35 amps at startup just for that half a second, three to three and a half times. So there's a service tip for you, okay? Now, when we have fuses, we're trying to protect the entire circuit. The wires uh, coming off of the fuses and feeding everything, we don't, if you don't have any protection, you don't have a circuit breaker or a fuse or whatever, and you put an exorbitant amount of current through a wire, it's going to burn in half, possibly could even start a fire. So we have the fuses to protect the entire circuit, but then we typically have overloads to protect individual motors like compressors or larger fan motors. Some small fan motors, little tiny ones, little baby exhaust fans about this big, baby evaporator fans and condenser fans and refrigeration and refrigerators, shaded pole motors, so inexpensive, they don't put any money into protecting them. There's no overload protection, but a lot of the other motors, they do have overload protection. So what are some of the types of that overload protection? We have this little overload here, this little bimetal clicks on um, overload that sits right on top of the compressor and the amperage for the common goes right through it. And the more amperage you have, the more heat you're gonna have. And if you have too much heat, it's going to open up the contact here. Okay, so you have this type of overload, this little clicks on overload. Uh, there's other types of thermal overloads, and we're going to go over um, that when we talk here about the um, mag starter or motor starter in a few minutes. Um, so we have the thermal type of overload that equates, takes the heat from the amperage and will trip off. And there's usually a little time lag involved. It, you know, Temperature is a lot about time. You know, you can have a little baby flame and put your hand right through it. You're not getting burned. You, you keep your hand in front of it, you're gonna get terribly burned, right? So a lot of times when a compressor pulls too much amps or stays at locked rotor amps, it takes a few seconds for it to heat up so much 
that it trips a thermal overload. Now, some more expensive industrial commercial systems, a lot of times they have magnetic overloads, which are like baby clamp-on ammeters or donuts that will pick up the magnetic field just like that. And if you have too much amperage, it shuts it off. And um, those are nice, they're more expensive, um, but I think they're a little bit quicker than your thermal overloads. Um, also, if a motor trips off on overload, you want to wait for it to cool down before condemning it. Uh, there's some motors like compressors that actually, uh, like window units, have something like this right inside the compressor itself. It's an inherent or internal overload, and you have to wait for it to cool down. So don't be condemning motors until they cool down. And especially one of my, I should almost create my... Uh, Ten Commandments of Air Conditioning and Refrigeration. When any air conditioning or refrigeration compressor shuts off for any reason, whether somebody trips over a plug and unplugs a refrigerator or a thermostat shuts off uh, the air conditioning or whatever, you should wait at least two to three minutes before restarting that compressor. It gives it a chance to cool down a little bit and it allows the refrigerant pressures on the high side and the low side to equalize as much as possible. Very rarely does the pressure on the high and low side fully equalize. Um, so as much as possible, so that way it makes it easier um, for the motor to start. Because if you have a high head pressure and you have to overcome that, it takes a lot more energy and the compressor may not be able to do it. And in refrigeration, because our boxes are so cold and the evaporators are such low pressures, even when the compressor's not running, even when the system's off, it has to overcome that head pressure. That's why you find more in small commercial refrigeration start capacitors for compressors than you do hardly ever find that in air conditioning. Okay, now let's take a look at, we looked at one of our diagrams, let's take a look at the other three. Okay, this is explaining like single pole, double pole type of switches. And I'll give you kind of an easy way to understand and clarify that. Let's look here, single pole, single throw. When we say poles, how many dots on the left do we have? One, single pole. And for this dot, how many dots do we have coming out the other side? Just one, single throw, right? Here is single pole, double throw. So one dot in and it's, how many uh, outputs does each pole have? How many places can it go? One, two, single pole double throw. So that when you energize the coil of the relay, this would close and this would open. Now this is double pole single throw, double because you have two dots in, but they each only have one output. You see that? Double pole, single throw. Let's look here at double pole, double throw. Double pole, input two, each having two outputs. Two outputs, two outputs. So that when you energize the coil, this would close, this would open, this would close, this would open. When it's de-energized, they look like this. And then finally we have here, triple pole, single throw, Three inputs, each having only one output per pole. Triple pole, single throw. I hope that clears it up for you a little bit because uh, I know it's explained in different ways and I've known a lot of students to be very confused about this single, uh, the polling and the throwing, okay? And then let's look over here at this diagram, which is similar to one in your text. Uh, power comes in and this is your contact or contact here. Let me move over to this side. And it comes in and when the contactor coil energizes, this would close and the compressor would run on the run winding and the start winding with the capacitor giving it a boost. And when the thermostat said, hey, it's cold enough in here or whatever, the contactor coil would de-energize, opening the contact, shutting off the compressor. But then we also look here and we have a crankcase heater, which is interesting. And how does this work? And this is a higher resistance. Um, 
generally over a thousand ohms, right? This is only maybe three or five ohms each. Power comes in, goes through the crankcase heater when this is not energized, and it uses up some of the voltage. And you don't have enough left to energize this. So you'll have enough, like a heater, whatever you, voltage you give it, it'll still put off heat. This is going to use up a lot of the volt, some of the voltage, and then you don't have enough to energize this, and this will get warm. Now, again, something they don't tell you in the books at all is, you know what also will get a little bit warm? Has to, Ohm's Law, is the run winding, which is okay. It adds a little heat to the compressor. The crankcase heater is there so that when the unit is off, you won't have refrigerant migrating to the compressor if it's in a colder location. Because a lot of times in the winter time, we don't run the air conditioning for four or five months. Uh, maybe in Southern California where I'm from, from it's only uh, three months. But in some parts of the country, it can be very cold outside, zero degrees. They don't run the air conditioning for six or seven months. And a lot of the refrigerant will, since the compressor's cold, it gets a very low pressure in it and the refrigerant migrates there and deposits itself as a liquid and mixes with the oil. And then we're trying to start the compressor, not with just oil lubricating it, but full of liquid refrigerant and oil, which is no good. So especially where it's very cold for long periods of time outside in the winter, in air conditioning is where you find crankcase heaters the most. And then uh, the compressor doesn't run when this is open. When this closes, Electricity takes the path of least resistance. This gets the full voltage. This isn't really a factor anymore. Now let's take here um, your uh, motor starter or mag starter here. So here's your contactor coil, or we could say motor starter coil. And a motor starter or mag starter, sometimes they even call it line starter, is exactly like um, a contactor, but just under in the top part of the construction is the same. But then in here on the bottom part, you have an extra like overload protection. And let me explain how that works for you. Okay, it's a thermal type of overload. And when you energize the contactor coil, let's say because the cooling thermostat says, hey, we're cold, we need cooling, let's rise up, we energize this, this closes, this closes, this closes, and when the compressor motor wasn't running, this was closed and your crankcase heater had gotten power and was warming the oil when the compressor was off. Now that these close, this one is normally closed. When you energize this, this snaps open while these three close. Power then comes through and runs the compressor. However, it's also going through these overload heaters. And this is one of the rare times, one of the rare exceptions, where you actually have two loads in series that are operating. Okay. Um, this doesn't hardly drop the voltage, but a couple of volts. So you still have plenty of voltage for the motor. But, and if the motor is pulling, a motor pulls the amperage it needs to run. Okay. And if the motor is like worn, not getting proper lubrication, has too high of a head pressure to overcome, uh, whatever, um, it's gonna pull higher amperage. And if it pulls higher amperage, that means the amperage that the motor's pulling gets sucked also through these heaters. The more amperage you have going through the heaters, the more heat you put off. And then right next to inside your mag starter, so it's all of this is basically in here, this part, here has its uh, the thermostats and the heaters has its own little separate section at the bottom of like a contactor making it a motor starter and when it puts off too much heat it would open up one of these contacts and all of these are in series with the contactor coil so if this one were to open up because this got too hot kills power here and shuts off the compressor by opening the contacts. And then generally you have a reset button on those where a service technician like you have to come and hit the reset button. And generally that's, you know, after the motor's cooled down and then you can check out what's going on. Do you have a loose connection? That's why you're dropping volts and the motor's running 
higher amps or what. Okay, so that kind of goes over um, how does a motor starter or a mag starter um, work. One final point um, in clarifying, uh, like we were talking about the mo uh, mag starter or motor starter, here's a contactor, and in the contactor you have the coil, which goes around, and when you energize the coil, you pull this in, closing the contacts, feeding power. That's what we've been talking about in um, these diagrams here, okay? Um, now, for 20 amps and above, we use contactors. For under 20 amps, uh, we typically use relays for something like an indoor fan motor or something like that that may only pull two or three amps. A lot of times we'll use a relay. So the function of a contactor and a relay is the same. They both have coils. They both have either normally open and or normally closed contacts. Um, it's just that one is beefier and handles more amperage on the contacts, which makes it a contactor. And then what's the difference between a motor starter and a contactor is that a motor starter has built-in overloads. Uh, that concludes my lecture. Thank you.